Ernie, I had a chance to meet Flo and Eddie, and it was in Baltimore. It was the Dundalk Heritage Festival. And talk about two fun and crazy guys and great entertainers. And I know you have some great backstories about the two of them. I don't know what you're talking about. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, no, absolutely. You know, uh, you know, you mentioned the key. The key to them was not only did they have big singles like Happy Together and, you know, some of those other ones, um, they were able to apply comedy to it. They had the flying Zanzini thing that threw through the hoop and they had all this crazy stuff. And it's really funny. It worked for them because they, their roots were in comedy. Okay. I mean, they're, I'm sorry, their roots were in music and they were both funny guys. Okay. Unlike Cheech and Chong, who I love, they started out in comedy and then tried to cross over into music. Okay. The problem there was that it was, yeah, it was sad because it really, they, their roots were in comedy and they should have stayed in comedy and tried to stay current with the marijuana movement. You know, they, they kind of got off the train. It's like being in a race and, you know, you're in the front of the pack, man, and nobody's even near you. And then you decide, well, you know, nobody's even near me. I think I'll just sit down for a minute and rest. Meanwhile, the pack keeps going and now you're midway back. And then pretty soon you're losing more and more momentum because you're expelling more and more energy to try and catch up. And you, you just, it's funny. The same with music, Mark and Howard, stayed current even though their big hits were in the 60s in the 70s and 80s they were huge they were doing all the background vocals you know they were working with bruce springsteen they were mar working with mark boland they were working with all these great acts who again like we talked earlier the respect the respect was there from the young musicians the young stars like bruce springsteen used them on hungry heart and all you know all the a lot of the, his songs and, you know, they became like superstars again, uh, you know, doing back, you know, doing background vocals and stuff with, you know, these major acts who respected them. And, and it was almost like, yeah, man, you've been there. You know how it works. Help me, you know, help me be right. And then, you know, there's some groups that didn't pay any attention at all that didn't feel that they needed the help. But, you know, working with them is funny. I first met Mark on the Vampires softball team, okay? It was Mickey Dolan, Sean Cassidy, David Cassidy, um, uh, Alice Cooper, whose group it was, Mark Volman. Howard wasn't there, but Mark was a real jock. So, and I was on the team. I designed the logo for him, and we, we played uh, other softball teams. And this was Alice's. And then I guess it evolved on to being today the Hollywood Vampire which is not really a softball team, but that's kind of how it started. And that's where I met Mark. And we hit it off right away. And there's like this, because I always liked baseball. I played Little League. I played Pony League. And so it was right there in my alley. And he was, just, you know, we just hit it off. He had a lot of respect for us in the album covers that we had done for Alice. And it's so funny where it was like a small, the industry is different now, but then it was like we got involved with Frank Zappa with Alice Cooper because he was signing to Bizarre Records, which was Frank Zappa's label. Well, Mark and Howard were part of the Mothers of Invention, which was Frank Zappa's group, you know? And so we had all this uh, history together and we had never met. And I had always loved the Turtles. I mean, I, you know, uh, their, their, Howard's voice was incredible. He had an incredible voice um, and Mark, was the perfect, it was like yin and yang. It was like, you know, Abbott and Costello. I told you that, you know, they rented at a certain point um, after we did a couple albums for them, they needed an office space and we had an extra office. So we leased them that office. And I swear to God, every day I look for it. Not only did I look forward to coming to work because I love what I did. I look forward to coming to work to see what they were going to be doing. They were the fluorescent leech and Eddie. We did this really cool logo. It never got used, but it was uh, Joe Garnett did the drawing. It was fluorescent leech and Eddie. And Eddie was like this really weird looking kid with like a, a jug head hat, you know, and he had this leech that was fluorescent and glowing. And they were, you know, it was Abbott and Costello. So they were fluorescent leech and Eddie. They were, you know, Mark and Howard. They were the turtles. 
you know, they were all these things in each, each day was like a new adventure. It was like being in a, in a, uh, a sitcom, you know, where every day you kind of show up and you're not sure there's no script because you don't know what's going to happen. And a lot of partying, those guys, I mean, they fit right in because Pacific Pioneer was a partying company. Okay. A lot of the rock stars used to love to come there because we were always partying and we were doing art and they would come and do their music. I mean, it was just really, they would play their rough tapes. It was an amazing time, Joyce. It really was. It was almost like looking back at it. It, it was like, it, it seemed like it, I mean, I know it happened, but it seemed like it was too real to be real. If that makes any sense at all. I mean, I, I went from being a huge fan to all, they're, they're with them. You know, we talked about this with so many other bands that I did work for. You know, the Turtles were a huge influence in my life and their music. And, you know, to, to meet with them and then not only be friends with them, but to then share an office space for over two years, you know, and it was just crazy. It was, I, you know, every day was a, a new adventure, a new thing. They were, uh, at one point, they were doing all the back, all the uh, vocals for Strawberry Shortcakes the TV series with the, you ever see that strawberry, strawberry short. Yes. Kid? Well, that was Mark and Howard. They did all the music, you know, and you know, so they were, and then they were doing a lot of the background stuff for other bands uh, because we're right there in LA. They lived in LA. It was very convenient. All the recording studios, all the rock stars come to LA to record, whether it was Wally Hyder or, you know, Sunset Sound or wherever, uh, you know, they would come to LA. LA was like a Mecca for music. And it was a mecca for album cover art. It was not, and different than art, okay, different than advertising art. It was album cover art. And it was a different, it was a whole different animal, you know. And we just, again, I just happened to be in the right spot at the right time. So in 1972, when I met them, we had already gotten, we had done some stuff for Alice. We're on the softball team. Mark and Howard knew of our work. Mark came to the studio. After our first game, he brought Howard over to the studio. And it was great. I mean, it was, you know, again, you know, it's, well, you know, you were talking about meeting them and stuff. Imagine working with them every day. And they're blasting music and partying, and we're blasting music and partying. Then we blast music together and party. I mean, it was awesome. It was it was just a great time. Pacific Iron Ear was a really, for me, you know, even though I stay current today, for me, that was my biggest moment in the sun, okay? It's important that we have our moment in the sun to prove that we were here, okay? Because people forget right away, you know, things move on and people forget. And we, you know, we look back at loved ones and, and idols that we had and influences, and they're all gone. You know, it's like stepping up to the plate. You know, I'm in line stepping up to the plate. At 77, that plate looks pretty close, and the line behind me looks really long. <laughs> and it used to be the other way around, you know. I mean, and, and we would talk. I mean, they were just incredible. You know, we were into Monty Python. They were into Monty Python. All their music. We, we, and, and, then, and then they went to – so we did – the fluorescent leech and Eddie, the Flo and Eddie, that album cover, they had no idea. They had nothing for the album cover. All they said was we wanted to be crazy. Everything we did for them had all these hidden things in it and just their craziness reflected in the covers that we did. And again, like I said before, one of the things that made us different from the record company, art departments were, that were our biggest competitor um, to other, a handful of other companies like Camouflage and, you know, um, Wadi, uh, Jimmy Wattel's company, Barnstorm or whatever. There were just a small handful of companies like the Pioneer. And what made us different was that we really got into the act. We got into the music. We were huge fans. We just didn't work at a place where that was what we did every day. And we just sort of treated it like it was another one in the assembly line going out the door. Okay. Uh, there are plenty of art directors and record companies and creative director co that, that have done more albums than I have. I've done 249. But the pride that I take in that is nobody handed them to us, okay? We fought for each and every one of those album covers, and I love each and every one of those, 249. We didn't fail on anything, you know? It, some of them fell a little short musically than others, but it didn't matter. It was, it was about the friendship that we had. I think we probably did three or four 
albums. I mean, I did two series for Sire Records and another one for uh, Golden something or other. Anyway, those were the only works that we really did for a record company because the groups would come to us because of the fact that we would take the time to really understand the messaging that they wanted to convey in that cover. Because that cover, there was no MTV, there was no iTunes, there was a record store, okay? And that record store was like an ocean of records. And so what would make my cover stand out? It, you know, it's funny because we used to be Tower, Tower Records, was right up the road from us. And we used to go there at least four times a week and go through each saw each group, group that we'd done work for and take the album. If it was back in the, in the band, because there were newer albums in front of it, we'd take it and we'd put it in the front. You know, it was one of those kind of things because that was, I mean, I went to, I went to a record store at least five times a week, at least, spending at least a half hour to an hour in a record store and more than just Tower Records. There was Licorice Pizza, there was a whole bunch of other stores, Amoeba, that came later, but that was what I did. It's like when I started doing work for Nestle and Kraft, I would spend hours in grocery stores looking at new pro looking at what's out there, taking a product uh, that's got eye-catching color that was in a different category on something that I was working for, and I would take it over and put it in the category I was working for to see how it jumped out or not. Same thing with album covers. You know, I would look at what was out there. I would spend hours studying everybody else's work so that I made sure, number one, that I didn't do what they were doing, you know? And that's how, and to me, that's what separates good from great. You know, today we're so willing to accept mediocre as good, and there is no such thing as great, very rarely. But to me, everything I do, I have to push it that way. It has to be great. Otherwise, I don't want to do it. You know, and I've, I've turned down more work than I ever dreamed that I would uh, earlier on in my career because I just don't want to do it. You know, uh, and, you know, I know I'm speaking to the choir here uh, because, you know, you've done you've done that yourself in your career. So, you know what I'm saying? So we we did the fluorescent leech and Eddie. I had this photograph of these kids waving. And so I did the Mark's hair on one and Howard's hair on the other. And, you know, that was the album cover. You know, then they had us do Happy Together Again. OK, so if you can see this album cover. Uh, on the front cover, it's a, a girl and a boy tortoise, turtle, hugging each other, looking into the moonlight uh, over the water, okay, and they're sitting on a log, and they're, like, hugging, and then you go to the back cover, and there's panties and underwear and stuff spread around, and the boy turtle is in the shell with the female turtle, and it's rocking back and forth, <laughs> and they loved it. I mean, it was just, it was... It was probably some of the closest freedom that we had. The record companies and the album covers that we did were probably the freest I've ever been in my career. Because then what happens is there's not a lot of money, in it, but you get the freedom. Okay. Then you move over to corporate America and you get the money but you don't get the freedom. Absolutely. You know? yeah, absolutely. You, and God bless people like Howard Stern in your industry that was able to do both. You know, every once in a while, there are those individuals that are able to do that, you know, and reap from both. Um, and, you know, Mark and Howard, they were like that. They never, they never gave up. And I never, ever heard them say, well, you know, we don't know what we're going to do next, or this really sucks, or, you know, you and I need to grow apart. You need to go your way, and I need to go. And again, I was close with them for years. Mark and his wife and Bonnie and I became friends, and we would babysit their, go, excuse me, their two daughters. So, I mean, we became really good, just like Kenny Rankin. We talked about Kenny last week. I'm going to send you a couple pictures here after the thing with Kenny and I and George Carlin. Anyway, uh, we got to be close friends and, you know, hung out with them and their kids. And, you know, Mark's daughters love coming over and hanging out, being down in the art department. We'd sit them at a desk and give them crayons because the art department was downstairs and we lived upstairs. So it was, if I was ever late to work, I'd just jump out the window. You know, it was great. So, but anyway, so, so you know, doing that cover was really great. And then they went to Jamaica, okay, um, in, in 1980, 81. They went to Jamaica, and they did Rock Steady with Flo and Eddie. And, uh, again, you know, I didn't put the back cover up, or maybe I did. Yes, I did. 
you can see that we they were in Jamaica, but we did this Jamaican shot. We're looking like they're there, but if you follow it around the back, you can see it's a sound stage, and everything's sort of prop, and all their stuff is there. I mean, it was, you know, it was their sense of humor. And I, I think I, I had mentioned this before. Out of all the album covers I've done, I can show you tons, that, and they're none, of, they're none of them are alike. None of them are the same. Design companies like ours and record company art departments would get into a look. They would create a look, and that's what they did. It was like, it was, they, it was like having a template, okay? It was like you working at a radio station, and they give you a template of what you can play and what you can't and what you can say. And Well, that's not what you're about. You, wanna, you have this amazing ability to have such knowledge of the music that you play. I listen every week, and I'll tell you, I'm blown away. I, I learned stuff from you that I didn't know, you know, about the groups that I knew. How do you know more about them than I do? I, I hung out with them. Well, I'm know? learning from you, too, well, you know, especially about Kenny Rankin. Oh, did you listen to any of his music? Love him. He is. I love the way he scat sings. Oh. Nobody's that is better. just, I mean, I, I was, uh, when I was listening so closely, and, you know, my litmus test is when an artist that just takes you away from where you are at, you really get into it, and Kenny did that. Kenny was my brother. Kenny and I, Kenny and I were, and George were like the three musketeers, but Kenny and I were brothers. And um, when he passed away, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. And I have a clock in my office. This is the weirdest thing. This is a true story. He gave me a clock. He was on tour somewhere. And he knew I was into the 40s and 30s and all that stuff. So he got me this clock. It's absolutely beautiful with um, a cook. There's a chef and this cool Art Deco lettering. It's got to be from the early 40s. And he gave me this clock. And I have it. I had it all these years. And it, it, for some reason, it stopped working. It stopped working the same hour that Kenny Rankin passed away. Oh, my. That's, that's really something. That's a I'm sp- telling you, the spiritual hair, message. You can see the hair is straight up. Spiritual message. Straight up. Every time I look at that clock, it's hanging in my office. Every time I look at that clock, I think of Kenny. And how crazy he was and, and how talented. George would come over and we'd be partying and Kenny would show up with his guitar. This is like 2 in the morning. <laughs> and Kenny would be playing, and George would be doing his bit, and Bonnie and I would be sitting there in our pajamas, go, "Oh, this is really great. We got our own private show at our, you know, if our ki- if our dining room table could have talked, there was so many stories that it had, you know, like if the walls had ears, yeah, you know, uh, it, it was um, it was an amazing time, and you know, and I, yeah, you really I, captured the artist. That's the thing that I get from your work you know, when I first started to see it is that you, know, you look at the artist, you get to know them when you followed so many and you were fans and you bring out that special thing that the artist, the special message and you capture it in your art. I am laughing at that rock study with Flo and Eddie. That is just so yeah. them. Let me, let me that is that. so them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, you think they're in Jamaica, and all of a sudden you're out, you see it's a soundstage with all their stuff spread out everywhere. I mean, every, every, every we only did a few albums together. And then, but, but, you know, in 1981, well, around 1984, we had a client, Rock and, uh, was called Active West, and they owned 38 bowling alleys in Southern California. And Mark and Howard were working out of the office and they had all these connections, you know, and, and, and uh, so the our, we came up with this idea that the client needed to build traffic during the summer months in their bowling alleys in Southern California, which is like finding a chicken's tooth, you know, so we, uh, you know, it, summers where kids were outside, they didn't go inside. So we came up with this idea of rock and bowl and Bill Garland did this beautiful Frank Fazetta kind of, illustration that's very dynamic and I did this really cool lettering rock and bowl and we came up with this idea of kids going into the bowling alleys entering to win a chance to bowl with your favorite rock star okay and so we needed to get rock stars and I mean we knew a couple people but Mark and Howard right there we hired them they got us there must have been 60 people like Alice Cooper Bernie Toppin Sean and, and David Cassidy 
you know, REO Speedwagon, Kansas, you name it, LeVar Burton, the guys from Barney Miller, you know, they, it was amazing to watch them. They would, each day they would plan and make these calls and, you know, and then, then they would go, well, you know, we already got LeVar Burton and LeVar is going to be there and, you know, you really need to be there. And he would leverage all this stuff that they, and it was like watching a ground, like one day they didn't have anybody. Then the next day they had two or three. And then the next day, the next week they had seven or eight. And it just was over the course of about a month, they recruited about 60 uh, rock stars and, and TV stars, a couple of movie stars. You know, it was pretty amazing. It, and then the, the whole thing culminated with uh, uh, each bowling alley would draw winners, okay, and those winners would be a team to bowl with their favorite star. And there was 60-something lanes in this huge bowling alley that was their master bowling alley. And we had over 3,000 kids in the parking lot that couldn't get in. We tied in with uh, Q, uh, I think it was Q10 Radio. It was the cool radio station that all the kids listened to in the, in the 80s. And so we tied in with them. They would promote the rock and bowl thing. And we did this, just this interviews that they would play. And, you know, this is, this is Mark Bowman or Bernie Toppin, and I hope you're going to be there. It's going to be a great event. You know, and it was just awesome. And they put that whole thing together for us. And it was amazing to watch them work. It was like being in a recording studio watching them create. They were creating in a different way, but leveraging who they were and the respect that they got. I mean, it was amazing. It was, it was just an amazing thing. And, and I, and I got to tell you, you know, and I, Howard, I think, is not well. But Mark is teaching, I think, and he's pretty much they won a huge lawsuit against Cirrus Radio for millions of dollars because they were screwing them out of the royalties uh, of the airplay. And then I think they ended up paying major record companies too, Cirrus Radio, because they weren't paying any residuals. And Mark and Howard led that charge to get, you know, and then I, th I heard that uh, Sly Stone got like $3 million or something. Same thing. Uh, they were screwing them out of the you know, the royalties of the play, you know, when they played it. So, so Mark and Howard have made an amazing mark on the world, you know, of music and in my heart, both of them. I mean, I hold them very close to my heart like I do a lot of others and not that many, but a bunch. And those guys were probably the most creative I've ever worked with. They were, they were just awesome. And as, as far as music, I like the reggae version of Happy Together. Okay, ooh, they, ooh. Do it. they do it, a cover of it, and and then also uh, Rock With Me is another good cut. I mean, that whole album, that rock, and when they came back, you know, Mark had dreadlocks, they were, they had brought some ganj back, and they were talking like, I Ray, man, you know, I Ray, they were like, you thought there were two Jamaicans in the other room, you know, they and they were there for like three or four months recording, they recorded the Rock Steady album in Jamaica. And had some great stories, great stories, and they were great appreciators of the ganj and you know, and and very spiritual. They came back; they were different guys. They really were, and, and you know, they grew. They, I watched them grow those few years that we were very tight and everything. I watched them grow just like Kenny. You know, unfortunately, you know the the candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long, yeah. and I think that's a true. You know, Billy Joel said it best, only the good die young. That's so very true, you know. Well, you know, as a, as we're about to wrap up Ernie's Corner, I, uh, you know, Ernie, this is something, 1966. That was my first time of seeing the Turtles. I was only 10 years old and was with Paul Revere and the Raiders. Yeah. And this was before, you know, the Turtles really hit it big. And it was just a joy watching Mark and Howard on yeah. stage. There was a respect, as you so mentioned, and even – for as young as I was, I could see that it was there. It was and the it was talent was there too. True. Yeah. True. They were great. You know, I mean, and they never, you know, they never failed to take a chance. They were real risk takers in a lot of ways, and it paid off for them. It, it really did. Everything they touched eventually went well for them. You know, and God bless them. I, you know, I I haven't talked to either one of them in years, but I I, 
I got to reconnect. We're going to, we want to interview them for the book that we're doing, the Pacific Ironier book. And they were a big part of that. And oh, at some point, I'll find all those. I have probably 200 photographs of the parking lot at the rock yes. and roll thing and also shots inside of the individual teams and with their stars and stuff. Have it all. The biggest mistake we ever made on that was to not video it. But video wasn't really. No. It was film. You had to shoot film, and we didn't really have a budget to shoot film, although we did raise $50,000 for the California Special Olympics. That was the other thing that they really leveraged. It was an event that we did for the California Special Olympics. We raised $50,000, and wouldn't you know it, a year later, Jerry Brown was governor. He came to our office with this guy who was his head of education. I forget the guy's name. And they had this Asian kid that was, um, he couldn't speak or hear, but he did sign language and he was an artist. And they wanted him to work with us in, in Pacific Ioneer and help him create this whole thing that, that Jerry Brown was doing, this program for the Special Olympics. The, you know, and it was great. I mean, he was really, I mean, we learned how to sign, you know, because that's how we talked to him. And he was, you know, he was just loving being there, you know, I mean, it was, Everything in, in my life and everything in, in most people's lives, everybody's lives, if you just take a minute and think about it, it all links together. The good times, the bad times, you know, it, it's all there. It's all there. And, you know, just to be able to have the visual landmarks that I have to look at and remember, you know, and doing this show with you, I got to tell you, I'm loving it. I absolutely love it. I love everybody on the, on the block. You've got a great bunch of neighbors here you've done a great job in really making this something i'm just so pleased to be a little bit part of it, you know and, and thank you so much you I'll are you so there. welcome ernie we love having you thank you i love i love being had <laughs> in a good way in a good way i only need it in a good way in a good way don't take me wrong i love it All right, well, i'll see you next week and uh, you know i'm always here on the corner just Pick me up on Facebook. <laughs>